So you were uh, mayor of San Antonio. You were uh, secretary of housing. I was. And uh, and now you are running for president. It is a, a crowded field. I don't need to tell you. Uh, <laughs> you you maybe don't have as much name recognition as some of the candidates. And on top of that all, uh, people often confuse you with your twin. You're really encouraging me yeah. tonight, Seth. You're really encouraging me tonight. <laughs> well, I feel better about else. myself already. <laughs> well, you have, a, you have a twin brother I who's do. a congressman. I do. And so uh, I, I imagine that, uh, you know, uh, just like any twin, that probably gets in the way of name recognition as well. <laughs> That's true. You know, about uh, two months ago, he grew a beard so oh, that people I... could tell us apart. And then he realized that it looked so bad <laughs> that uh, it wasn't worth it. And he shaved like four weeks later. He likes to go around telling people that the way to tell us apart is that I'm one minute uglier than he is. <laughs> That's very uh, nice. uh, you, uh, you had been a uh, mayor when you got uh, tapped uh, by the Obama administration. And, and President Obama called you to ask you to, to be the Secretary of Housing. How, what was that like to get a phone call like that? <laughs> he did. In fact, I remember that it was on April 16th. 2014, and I remember because I had just driven through the drive-thru at Panda Express uh -huh. when he called me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know how on your phone it says uh, like unknown or block call? It said uh, private. So for all of you, if you ever get a phone call that says private, like answer the phone. <laughs> Hopefully I'll be the one on the other <laughs> right, end of the line. Yeah, there you go. Uh, did you tell him when he called that you were uh, you just gotten Panda Express? No, no. I think I pretended like I was behind my mayoral <laughs> off my desk. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm still working at nine o'clock. You're at like nine. yelling yeah. at people who aren't there. Like, I'll tell, deal with that later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you had a background in housing. Uh, that was one of the reasons that he tapped you. That was a policy issue that you had spent years on. Uh, we obviously we referenced it earlier in the show. Uh, ben Carson, uh, obviously a, a very gifted uh, neurosurgeon. Uh, but that is different than housing. Um, how, what is it like to have had that position and look at someone uh, who, who doesn't seem to have the same outlook on it? Oh, I mean, his hearing yesterday was like watching a slow motion train wreck until they got to the Oreo part. And then it was like, oh, man, just, you know, <laughs> yeah. what do you say about that? I was telling some folks yesterday that it was, this was one of the classic cases of, um, it would be funny if it weren't so sad. Well, that, I think the sad part is, again, because, you know, obviously different parties are going to have different outlooks on how to uh, handle issues sure. in this country, but it, it seems as though his position is just disdain for the idea of the government providing housing to those who need it. Yeah, I mean, what I disagree with him on is that he seems to think that if you're poor, that there's something wrong with you. And I completely reject that. You know, HUD serves a lot of people who are trying their best, a lot of folks who are working hard, and uh, just because you're poor doesn't mean that something's wrong with you. You, uh, you know, I think uh, we've noticed it amongst many of the candidates who have, have thrown their hat in the ring, uh, trying to find a, a signature issue, trying to find a thing to let people know how you might be different than others. Immigration uh, seems to be what you are uh, staking as your, as your issue. Obviously, you come from a border state. What about immigration uh, is different as far as how you see it? Well, I think in Texas, you know, we know that the people that are trying to come to our border who are fleeing desperate circumstances are not a national security threat. They're not somehow evil. Uh, they're here because they want a better life for themselves and for their little children. And they're like immigrants who have come to this country over the generations from different places. Uh, and that this president, from the very beginning of his campaign, has demonized them and used them as a scapegoat. And on their backs is basically trying to get reelected in 2020. And so I just wanted to put out an immigration plan that represents the complete opposite of what this president does and says, look, we can have a border that's secure, but we can be compassionate instead of cruel. You, I think everyone, uh, or I should say many people, are critical of uh, the Trump administration's uh, policy in regards to uh, immigration. But obviously, you know, Barack Obama, you know, he uh, deported record number of people, particularly early in his presidency. How do, you, how do you distinguish yourself not just from what President Trump did, but what President Obama and administration you worked for did? Yeah, well, I mean, I think what happened in the Obama administration is that the Obama, Obama administration over the years got stronger, got better on that issue of immigration, right? I mean, in 2014, 2012, you had DACA, that was released. And then in 2014, they did DAPA, which was supposed to cover the parents. Um, the number of deportations of people actually went down mm -hmm. through those years. And uh, the other lesson that I think we learned from that administration was that when we have the chance, when we have the Democratic majority, because I think that 
on January 20th, 2021 at 12.01 p.m., we're going to have a Democratic president, a Democratic House, and a Democratic Senate. Uh, that what we learned is that from the 2009, 2010 experiences, don't wait on immigration reform. Like, we're not going to wait this mm -hmm. time. We're going to push sensible immigration reform. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, an ideal outcome uh, for yourself would, of course, be, you know, the presidency uh, and, and both houses. You know, one of the things that might actually seem like the hardest right now is the Senate. And, you know, there are just fewer houses, uh, fewer races that uh, seem likely to flip. Uh, and some of the criticism of this incredibly talented field of people, of which you're a part of running for president, is that they could maybe serve the party better by running for Senate, that someone like you or someone like Beto O'Rourke might have a better chance of winning a Senate seat in Texas than the presidency. Like, how do you speak to Well, I to think that? Beto would be a great Senate candidate. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. <laughs> uh, there, there are great folks that are running in Texas uh, that are already starting to line up. My brother was thinking about running, and then he decided not to. Well, they, said, they yeah. saw that beard, and they were like, I'm not going to vote for that guy. <laughs> Uh, has it been strange to, uh, I, you know, it seems as though every day someone else jumps in the race, I think, you know, uh, by whatever count, you know, 21, 22, 23 people. Uh, at this point, do you kind of want to say, hey, that's enough? <laughs> well, I would have said it was enough after I announced, you know. <laughs> yeah. After I got in, that's it. But, yeah, we got 23 people now. Bill de Blasio was the last one to get yeah. in a few days ago. Uh, and, you know, Lith I just talked to John Lithgow on his way out. He, he pointed out that we have enough for both the offense and the defense of a football team. Yeah. <laughs> and we have one extra. Too. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, well, mean, that's good, because one of you is going to get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> that's probably true. Yes. Hey, uh, uh, keep your health up, uh, keep your energy up, and thanks so much I for will. being here. I really appreciate thanks it. Thanks a lot. Julian Castro, everybody.